the front afternoon. It's Ben Eggleton. You've been hearing about the pupils along the way and have seen various people from that organization present to you. Uh, ben is the director of, uh, of, of, of PUDIS, so you will get a high-level overview of some of the aims of, of the center. To give you a little bit of background, um, Ben got his PhD here at the University of Sydney in 96, then went to the US uh, and worked at Bell Labs for oh, seven years, if I'm not mistaken, worked himself up. Started as a postdoc and I finished up as a director of optical fiber research. And uh, then came back to the University of Sydney as a Federation Fellow, which for those of you who don't know, is one of, it is the highest fellowship you can get in the Australian research system. Okay? And he'll be talking about ultra-fast nonlinear optics on a chip, breaking the terabit per second barrier. Um, do you take questions yes. along the way? Yes. Or? Absolutely. Okay, so don't hesitate to, um, to interrupt when you have a question. There will also, of course, be question time at the tea break and at the end. So, all right. Thank you, Martin. Uh, and it's good to speak to you today. No, As Martin suggested, what I will try to do in the next hour and a half is to uh, initially high-level overview of uh, some of the, the goals of KUDOS, try to give you a high-level perspective of where we're going, in fact, in the future, and some of the exciting sites that we uh, plan over the next five years. I'm then going to step back and, in fact, focus more on uh, some of the research we've been doing over the last couple of years uh, that uh, really more relates to the topic, ultra-fast nonlinear optics on a chip. I think you'll see as I go through the presentation that my story will link to a number of the presentations you've heard from uh, Yuri Kivshar, Ross McFedrin, Steve Madden, and also will relate to the presentation you'll hear this afternoon from Mark Belusi. So let me get going. So as uh, Martin said, KUDOS uh, is actually a collaboration of um, six universities funded by the Australian Research Council. And I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about the center in the few, first few slides, but this is an outline. I'll start with this um, talk about this photonic integration paradigm. Try to present a vision that says photonic integration really is a new paradigm in the 21st century for photonic processing. And as I said, talk about where we're going. I'll then focus on this ultra-fast photonic integrated circuit. I'll try to give uh, some societal perspective to the science challenges here in terms of the so-called capacity energy crunch in the internet. I'll focus then on the terabit per second grand challenge. I'll review some of our recent breakthrough results reported earlier this year as a post-deadline paper in San Diego where we reported the first demonstration of chip-based terabit per second processing and proposed an architecture for terabit per second ethernet and then to get a completely change gears uh, and this will probably be in the second half uh, talk about slow light some really fascinating physics uh, here but also some potential applications in optical processing okay so let me talk a little bit about kudos we were formed in uh, 2003 with a vision to create a photonic chip. This is an artist's impression. You can see on the left there. And so it's a team of 100 uh, researchers across the six universities that I mentioned. And we've created some world-class infrastructure and capabilities along the lines of what you see in uh, major universities around the world for fabrication of integrated circuit. Oh. Fabricate, this is not going to work with two hands. Fabrication of integrated devices, new material science. Um, and our research has appeared in some of the premier journals, so um, Nature Photonics, Advanced Materials, and we've created some pretty exotic structures that you'll hear me talk about. Uh, this is not a photonic device, but I believe you were down at City Harbour the other night. You may have seen this. This is a structure that was fabricated in a polymer. It's a few tens of microns. Uh, we've created completely new architectures for uh, photonic processing based on slow light. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. We've also worked with our industry partners to commercialise technology. So what's, what's the vision? I guess to st step back and say where we've come from in the 90s, 
um, photonic integration optics was uh, very much um, a, a laboratory curiosity, and we rely heavily on electronic processing for everything in communication systems. And one might say that um, electronics is complicated. It's certainly energy hungry, low bandwidth a solution. And so the initial paradigm shift it has been to create the simple photonic processes. And I'm going to talk in, in detail about these photonic processes. And as I mentioned and as I'll describe, we've established some basic proof of concept of doing basic logic on an integrated circuit at very, very high bit rates. But it's only the beginning. And in fact, the future is uh, very exciting. And uh, I'll try to give you a, a few hints of where we're going in the next few slides. Uh, we're imagining much more sophisticated photonic circuits. Uh, Multifunctional processing, and that implies more complicated uh, structures. And we're imagining applications far beyond communications. And I'll give a few hints at where we might be going. And importantly, uh, we're imagining now very energy efficient photonic processing. And as I'll say later on, it turns out that energy has become a very significant issue in the context of the internet. Uh, and I'll give you some concrete, uh, concrete understanding of those issues. So, a little bit more about Kudos. We're a vertically integrated program. So, we bring together, as I said, 100 researchers across six universities and international collaborators. We build on a platform of fundamental science. So, and I'll talk a little bit about our research in metamaterials. You've heard from Yuri Kifshar, slow light I'll talk more about, and nonlinear optics is the central theme of this talk. But we build on that fundamental science with a strong program in platform science, hybrid integration, uh, material science, so that we can actually create these uh, photonic circuits, device science, relying on nanofabrication, advanced modeling, and a focus on photonic processing. Of course, we focus on publications, intellectual property, commercialization, as I mentioned, and uh, ultimately trying to deliver some national benefit to Australia. So this is a long-term research goal. Um, this is a circuit that uh, I'll talk about that has taken five or six years to create, but it is only the beginning, as I said. And I'll, as, I, as I mentioned, I will give you a few hints about where we're going um, to create a completely new class of photonic integrated circuits. If you look closely at this circuit, you might see some familiar structures, something that you might have heard from Yuri and others. Uh, metamaterials integrated onto this chip and plasmonic circuits to provide completely new degrees of freedom for confinement and control. Um, this is a multidisciplinary program and it's essential that we have this vertically integrated structure that I talked about to sustain this multi-year uh, activity. Um, and we have a degree in project management. I don't want to, to burden you guys with this, um, but uh, we rely on a sophisticated management structure for this research program. So, What's the big deal here? There are a couple of very high-level grand science challenges. And these are not just challenges that our program faces, but you'll find programs around the world. Uh, one is simply capacity and speed. And this is driven by the internet and bandwidth. Uh, the continued demand for more capacity, uh, driven by uh, the global internet, also driven by uh, data centers that are now appearing. For example, Google, uh, Microsoft. And this is pushing us to uh, uh, the ultimate limits in terms of the speed of our photonic processes. And we're imagining processes that can uh, switch and perform logic on light at, on a time scale similar to the, a single cycle of light. So this is down at, at several femtoseconds. As I mentioned, we're also imagining more sophisticated functionality and multifunctionality in particular. This implies uh, a high degree of complexity, and this pushes us towards sub-wavelength uh, control. And so this is similar to the evolution that you saw in the microelectronics field, where the initial transistors have evolved now into very sophisticated microelectronic circuits that are the backbone of uh, multiple computers and blackberries. And so we're seeing that same evolution or revolution now from optical fiber processors, these simple photonic processors that I'll talk about, to this more exotic our photonic integrated circuit that we hope to build in the future. There's also this issue of low power that I've mentioned, and as I'll explain in more detail, this turns out to be a really big deal. Uh, power consumption in the internet is significant and it increases with the capacity, something that wasn't appreciated until a few years ago. 
Uh, and I'll give you some concrete examples of this. At the same time, um, as we consider low power processing, we can even consider processing at the single photon limit. And if we can process information at the single photon limit, there's even the possibility of achieving uh, quantum information processing on a chip. A very exciting prospect for um, photonic integration. Now all of these uh, grand science goals are pointing towards nanophotonics and hyper integration to control light on a sub wavelength scale. Um, and we believe that this is really the key to uh, creating a, a revolutionary photonic integration platform that will solve many of these uh, key societal problems. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about some of the new science. So you've heard from Yuri Kifchar this week about metamaterials and you would have been told that in fact uh, structures that incorporate uh, nano uh, structured elements have been uh, part of our world for thousands of years and often uh, you'll hear people like Ross McFedrin talk about the Lycurgus cup and this is a cup made of glass and incorporates nanoscopic pieces of metal and the point is that the, the nanoscopic metallic structures give the colouring and so in reflection here it appears green but in transmission it's red it's a simple example of a metamaterial. Uh, we also see structures like this in the churches, uh, stained glass windows, really behave uh, in a similar way. The colouring comes about from the nanostructuring of the glass. So the theme is that you can now control the macroscopic properties of these materials through the nanostructuring of the underlying material. And that's, that's really the concept of the metamaterial. Now more recently, we, we've started to hear about cloaking which is a, a very exciting example of a metamaterial. And the results that have appeared till date, uh, until very recently, have been in the microwave frequency regime because clearly the microwave frequency regime is much more achievable in the lab. Lead scales uh, lead itself to um, creating uh, these, these devices. But what's really exciting is that now this uh, nano science paradigm of the 21st century provides for the first time the opportunity to create these structures. Uh, we can take advantage of the significant investment in infrastructure in Australia and around the world. This is an electron beam lithography system. As you might know, these structured systems have resolutions of a few tens of nanometers, and so they are quite capable of creating uh, many materials that, uh, that possess these striking optical properties at wavelengths that are of interest for communications in other areas. In fact, in our vision, we're looking to uh, to uh, incorporate these metamaterials into our photonic circuits. Uh, but uh, more than just uh, basic structures here, we're imagining metamaterials that are in fact tunable and where we can actually control the macroscopic properties of these materials by dialing in the uh, properties of these metamaterials with liquid crystal, for example, and you would have heard from Yuri Kifshar earlier this week. Why is that exciting? Well, there are a number of striking properties. One uh, particular property is the concept of negative refraction um, and uh, this simple example it shows you what um, a glass of water based on a material with a negative refractive index how that might manifest. You can see on the left hand side a conventional um, uh, material and you see the traditional refraction. The material based on a negative refractive index possesses this um, very surprising uh, refractive property. The straw appears to bend back towards the other side. Possibly more striking than this simple example is the concept proposed by Sir John Pendry of the perfect lens. And, and what he illustrated theoretically, and we've seen some experimental work from groups around the world, is that you can create a so-called perfect lens that's not limited in its resolution. And of course, uh, this is a revolutionary concept that uh, is motivating researchers all the way around the world, theorists, experimentalists, nanos, fabricators, to create these uh, so-called perfect lenses. If you could truly create a perfect lens that you might revolutionise lithography, uh, you'll certainly transform imaging science and other very exciting areas of, of modern physics. So, a closer look. Um, we're imagining the photonic integrated circuit that, that incorporates a number of these structures to do photonic processing um, in ways that are not currently achievable. This is the future. I, I can't give you concrete description on how these building blocks will work right now but it trying to give you a hint of where we're going. And so if you look at this diagram, you can see uh, wires that bring light onto a chip and ring resonators that might couple light into 
a measure material here, and the measure material will uh, provide uh, some basic photonic processing and, 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 and control of light, and light is then coupled back. And you'll also note, if you look carefully, that this is in fact a hybrid structure, so there's a third dimension that comes out of the page. Uh, so the light here is being coupled back into a wire and then down underneath the sub, uh, upper, upper substrate into another layer that's buried under the, uh, the surface. Um, so there are all sorts of exciting possibilities, and that's really the future of, um, of our, our science program. So I'm now going to start to talk a little bit more about the science and the physics of where we're going in the next couple of years and the research achievements over the last few years. Um, so if you think of the centre as a structure at the moment, we've got these new programs in nanophotonics and hydro integration um, with this focus on a number of very exciting areas. I'm going to focus on terabit second communications, which is really the research that's been going on in my group. So what's the overarching uh, theme here? To create a photonic integrated circuit that uh, has uh, potentially um, much more bandwidth than the equivalent electronic um, processor, uh, potentially reduced power consumption and increased functionality um, for advanced photonic processing. So why can't we do this right now? Let's now go into some of the, the physics and be a little bit more concrete. I guess this is equivalent at some level to uh, an electronic circuit, but it's a photonic um, circuit. And here we've got two underlying science challenges. We need a, re a response time here that's much faster than electronics, and that uh, will point us towards nonlinear optics. And so the response time here is picosecond in contrast with electronic where it's uh, many picoseconds. And we need an approach that um, uh, is compatible with uh, millimeter scale optical circuits. Okay, so I'm going to introduce these ideas. I'll talk about the nonlinear optics. You've heard a little bit from Steve Madden uh, based on Chi 3 nonlinear optics. I'll talk about the, the materials that we've created and I'll talk through the lithography that we use to, to find these very low loss waveguides and circuits. I'll then, in the second half of the talk, talk about photonic crystals. Um, and here I show you that photonic crystals are, uh, allow us to control the flow of light, and in particular they allow us to slow light down. And we can harness this slow light in a number of exciting ways, both uh, of fundamental significance and also in terms of this uh, photonic processing vision. So let me start with an equation. You've seen this before in nonlinear optics. You're often, uh, in, in optics, you, all, you come across this polarization term, and in the linear world, this is proportional to epsilon naught chi 1 e, that's associated with the refractive index. But in the nonlinear world, we need to consider higher order terms in this Taylor expansion. And of course, chi 2 is associated with the electro-optic effect, and in materials that have inversion symmetry, such as amorphous glasses, chi 2 is negligible. And in fact, uh, it's essentially zero for the glasses that I consider here. We're going to focus on chi 3, the third order nonlinearity, that manifests in a number of distinct nonlinear processes. The, the easiest one to understand at this point is the intensity dependent refractive index. So with these materials and these glasses that I'll describe, the refractive index is intensity dependent. And so N is N0 plus N2I, N2 is a material property, I is the intensity of light, and it's power on area. And I'll just draw your attention to the fact that the relevant parameter in this discussion is gamma. Uh, gamma characterizes the nonlinear waveguide, and so it is proportional to N2 on the effective area of the uh, waveguide. And so I'm going to show you that we can create waveguides where gamma can be many tens of thousands times larger than optical fibers, through very large N2 and also small effective area. And the important point, of course, is that this intensity dependent refractive index uh, is instantaneous. It's occurring on a time scale of tens of femtoseconds. It's much faster than anything that we can observe in our laboratories, at least. And it's certainly much faster than the, the speed that electronics is operating at. 
So this a third order nonlinearity manifests in a number of well-known nonlinear processes. Cell phase modulation, I'll say a little bit more about that. Cross phase modulation, which I'll come back to. Uh, Four-way mixing is critical, I'll say a little bit about that. And I'll also come back to third harmonic generation in the context of our recent work on slow light. So if we're imagining a photonic chip that harnesses this intensity dependent refractive index for processing, there are a number of key attributes. Um, we need a short length device. We want to integrate this nonlinear element into a chip. So we need a very large gamma. That should be straightforward because we want this to operate at a relatively low optical power. And as I'll mention, uh, it turns out dispersion engineering is critical. Our ability to tailor the dispersion of these waveguides is essential uh, because that leads to uh, parametric processes that we can harness. It also means that we can create solitons. I'll say a little bit more about that. Solitons are central to a number of nonlinear processes such as supercontinuum generation. So let me say a little bit more about cell phase modulation. In case you haven't already heard, um, cell phase modulation is when a pulse propagates through a nonlinear medium that possesses this third order nonlinearity. And so cell phase modulation affects the phase of an optical pulse due to the intensity dependent refractive index. So if you imagine a pulse propagating through a nonlinear medium with n intensity dependent, the phase of the wave is expressed as phi omega naught t minus k plus this constant phase term. But k now uh, is intensity dependent. So we get an intensity dependent phase shift along the pulse. Okay? And the key here is that the intensity instantaneous frequency along the pulse is defined at t. So the frequency along the pulse is now proportional to the i to t. So the pulse that has a roughly Gaussian shape acquires a chirp like this. Okay? So the chirp, the frequency is now proportional to the i to t. So as you go up here, the frequency goes down. Then you get to a minimum, then it goes back up through zero because the i to t is zero here, goes back up here, and then it goes back down again. So as the pulse propagates through a nonlinear medium and acquires this frequency chirp, importantly, the pulse shape doesn't change due to cell phase modulation, only the frequency chirp and the associated spectrum. So if we actually look in the frequency domain, so as a result of the time-varying phase shift, the time-varying instantaneous frequency, the spectrum of the transmitted pulse will broaden. Okay, so a pulse injected into a nonlinear waveguide starts off as a narrow uh, Gaussian uh, spectrum, and as it propagates through the nonlinear waveguide, it will broaden and acquire this uh, structure that we're all familiar with from textbooks. Um, and you can see here, after a high nonlinear phase shift, it accumulates the structure in the center. Then it has this null in the middle. And as it propagates further and further, it acquires more structure. This is really the most the, the canonical example of nonlinear optics. Broadening the spectrum of a signal through the third order nonlinearity. OK. I think Steve Madden has given you a, a presentation on Charcot and glass. Is that right? So you've heard the story, so I don't need to go through this in much detail, but let me sort of step back and say, given this motivation, given our vision, the challenge is to come up with a material where we can do this nonlinear processing on a length scale of a few centimetres at power levels that are reasonably practical. And so we need a glass or a material that has a massive nonlinearity. Now there are a number of different material systems that have been explored around the world, uh, semiconductors, organics, um, that possess large nonlinearities. We believe the Charcogeni glass family uh, represents really the holy grail because of a number of key attributes. In particular, it has a very large nonlinearity, it has very low loss, it has low two-photon absorption, it doesn't have free carriers, and it is compatible with photonic integration. Okay, so that's really motivated our program in the first place. Why does it have a large nonlinearity? That's actually a tutorial in its own right. That's associated with the molecular structure and bonds of this glass, but a simple explanation can be given which follows from Miller's rule, and you probably saw this from Steve Batten. Miller's rule essentially says for an amorphous material like glass, 
there's a monotonic relationship between the linear refractive index N0 and the nonlinear index N2. Okay, so this is here a bunch of data from a review article from one of our colleagues in Australia a number of years ago. You can see down on the left hand side silica. It has an index of about 1.45, of course. It has a nonlinear index that's um, pretty small. And that's good news for communications because silica is the basis of long haul optical fibre communications. And you wouldn't want this cell phase modulation to be going on in these long pieces of fibre because it clearly would muck up the signal. So that's good. But we want a large nonlinearity. What's a nuisance in communication systems in the transmission context? Here we harness to do this photonic processing. So there are a number of glass families that are being developed, as I mentioned. But up in the right hand corner are these charcogenides. And they have uh, nonlinearities that are, are as high as a thousand times that of silica. And as importantly, they have a large refractive index 2.7, approaching that of silicon. Okay? So starting to look exciting already. It's the, in the ballpark that um, it's compatible with this vision of a chip for photonic processing. It, it really is. And that, that's motivated our research over the last five to seven years. So the charcoal and glasses, as I'm sure Steve has said, is a family of glasses based on sulfur, selenium, or tellurium in combination with other elements. I don't want to get into too much detail. What I will say is that I will focus here on the Alstead trisulfide glass, which is the more mature glass within this family. And it has a number of distinct properties. Uh, it is in fact transparent to 10 microns. So if you remember that slide I showed you earlier, in terms of applications in mid infrared, this is why we are exploring that application area. Of course, it has a large nonlinearity, as I mentioned. It's a pure nonlinearity. And by pure, I mean there are no three carriers. And that's in contrast with many semiconductor uh, chip based solutions that have been explored for a nonlinearity. Because they are semiconductors, they tend to be electrons that flow through the material, uh, free carriers that uh, can complicate the response time. So it's not a pure nonlinearity. These glasses also have large Raman gain. I won't talk about that, but that's also a very useful and interesting property. And they're very photosensitive. That can be a nuisance also. It's worth comp comparing these glasses with other systems. So this is a table that lists a number of different um, media. Uh, so you have silica up here, normalised to one. And so you can see for silica fibre you need a number of kilometres of fibre. Bismuth oxide is attractive, uh, it has an N2, a few tens of that of silica. Um, and we can scale that down to a metre, these fibres tend to have very small core. And down to a metre, so that's starting to sound very attractive. Silicon's in here also with a large nonlinearity, turns out. Um, leading to a gamma of 100,000 times out of silica, and certainly it's compatible with this, this vision of a few centimetres, but it has three carriers. And so it turns out in many of the photonic processing applications we consider, these free carriers can be a real nuisance. So these charcogenides typically are a few hundred times that of silica, and with these very small effective areas, we can get gammas that are up in the ballpark of silicon Compatible with centimetre scale integration, but with no free carriers, so a pure nonlinearity. That's, that's why we are excited about this glass family. So, as you've seen from Stephen, I'll, I'll rush through some of these sites quickly and get to, get to the punchline. These glasses are deposited onto silica, thermal evaporation. We use photolithography and dry etching. Um, initial waveguide results, um, the losses were remarkably low, 0.05 dB per centimetre. That translates to about a dB propagation loss for a 22 centimetre waveguide. Okay, that's comparable to um, state of the art planar waveguides in any material. The losses we're suffering here are mostly due to coupling into the waveguide and off the waveguide, which uh, in principle can be reduced through engineering. Now that sounds very exciting at that level of loss. The problem is that um, we actually need to engineer these waveguides to control the dispersion. And so what we've been doing is creating waveguides that have a small, a smaller mode field area, this particular waveguide that looks like it's sort of sandwiched down, uh, in fact, uh, for the TN mode, the dispersion of this glass, which is initially normal dispersion shown here, is shifted all the way up and we've shifted it into the anomalous dispersion regime. So we've actually modified the dispersion. That's 
key to a number of nonlinear processes uh, to make them more efficient. So now we're down at one micron squared effective area. The gammas are a few tens of thousands, but the losses have gone up. The losses are now about 0.3 dB per centimetre. So the total insertion loss is about 12 dB. It turns out, in spite of the increase in loss, these waveguides have better performance for many of the applications that we've been exploring due to the dispersion uh, engineering, the reduced walk-off between uh, wavelengths associated with this uh, reduced dispersion. Um, let me now talk a little bit about cross-phase modulation. This is going to segue into my discussion of this uh, HERO result. So I mentioned self-phase modulation, where one pulse propagating through a nonlinear medium modulates its own phase, and it spectrally broadens. Now cross-phase modulation is a natural extension of that. So imagine two waves at different frequencies sent into a third-order nonlinear medium. And here you end up creating a polarization um, that is the sum of both cell phase and cross phase modulation. Essentially, the way to understand it is if you have one beam that's intense and another beam that's weak, this beam is going to modulate its own phase, but it's also going to modulate the phase of this guy here. Okay? The intensity dependent refractive index due to the beam here will modulate the phase of this guy at another frequency. And that's called cross-phase modulation. It's a pretty straightforward idea, and it's central to a number of the schemes that uh, we are exploiting. So let me talk about how we might use cross-phase modulation as the basis of wavelength conversion, because this comes back later on in the context of uh, some of our optical performance monitoring uh, technology. Let's imagine I've got a signal, a pulse signal, and I couple it into my nonlinear waveguide. And imagine I've got a CW laser. So this is my pulse signal. This is a CW laser, separated in frequency. They propagate through the nonlinear waveguide. The pulse signal will modulate the phase of that probe. OK? It'll broaden the spectrum of that probe. So that initial narrow band CW probe has acquired a phase modulation. It's broadened the spectrum. Now, on its own, the phase modulation on that probe will not modulate the intensity of the signal. But we can convert this phase modulation scheme into a wavelength conversion scheme, or a scheme that converts data from one wavelength to another, simply by filtering away the original CW laser. So if we filter the original CW laser, we've now got an intensity modulation at this new wavelength. Uh, in fact, this has been uh, exploited in uh, many uh, experiments Initially, five kilometers of silicon fiber, and this was uh, about a decade ago. And I'll show you some of our results in the integrated chip. Now, I, I show you this result for two reasons. One, because it's impressive in its own right that we can do this wavelength conversion on a chip, but also because it underpins the, uh, the concepts that I'm going to come back to in a few slides. So an experiment might look something like this. So here's my arsenic trisulfide circuit. This looks complicated, but it really isn't. This is my CW laser, constant wave monochromatic laser amplified, injected into this chip. This is my data signal, 40 gigabit per second, the pulses are about 10 picoseconds in duration. I amplify them, I filter them, and I inject them into the chip. They co-propagate through this chip, and then I amplify them and I do bit error rate using a, a lab like this. So this is uh, quite a heroic uh, experiment. <coughs> And the results look something like this. So here's your 40 gigabit per second signal. And this is your tunable laser. And I can tune that laser from, say, here up to here. And what you see, if you look very carefully, or you don't need to look very carefully, is that that CW laser has acquired these sidebands. OK? That is associated with cross-phase modulation. So, the cross-phase modulation has modulated the phase of this probe. It's broadening its spectrum. Um, and of course, on its own, that phase modulation doesn't modulate the intensity of that signal. I need to then filter away the original CW component to turn that into an intensity modulated signal. If you look carefully, you might see something else here. You might see these other, um, uh, these other bands of light here. Does anyone have a clue where that's coming from? 
This is pretty straightforward. So this is the tunable laser that I'm sweeping across. And it shows you that that CW probe acquires this additional frequency spectrum. It's broadening because of cross-phase modulation. But what I didn't expect is to generate these other sidebands here. So this is the pump, and I've got this guy here, but I've also got this guy here. I've got this guy here, but I've also generated something over there. Where is that coming from? Sorry? Phase modulation. Didn't get that. Phase modulation. Phase modulation. No, there's something else going on here. Does it, have you come across this this week? Like two F1 minus F2 type thing. Two F1 minus F2. I think that's probably right. Yes, four-way mixing. Yeah. Four-way mixing. So I'm not going to go into that in much detail, but I just wanted to point to that. Um, this cross-phase modulation scheme. There's no exchange of energy. All I'm doing is, is modulating the phase of this guy by the intensity of this signal. But there's no exchange of energy. But there are third order nonlinearities, in particular in the context of uh, dispersion engineered structures where phase matching allows the exchange of energy. So what's that going on here is in fact exactly what you said. You're creating energy here and here through four-way mixing. Well done. Um, okay. Got another 10 minutes, I think. So let me just talk about this, this result. Um, this is a paper that was reported earlier this year as a post deadline at OFC. It, it's really a, a flagship achievement for the centre and for the group presented by Chung in San Diego. It was a demonstration of photonic chip based 1.28 teraboard. That means uh, the, hat, the um, symbol rate is 1.28 uh, million, million times a second. Uh, optimization and receiver OTDM demand sounds like a lot of jargon, but what we've actually done is we've proposed a chip based processing for potential Ethernet application. Um, let me give this some, some context. Uh, where does this teragram per second come from? There are a couple of different ways of looking at it. This is a, a picture from a recent review article, Andrew Ellis, uh, in Ireland. And he plots here on the vertical axis on the left hand side. Um, this is for the last few decades. What the typical Western country uh, is uh, the access rates in a typical Western country. So this is the net access rate. And I believe that's this curve here. So you can see that in 1980, the typical home was getting a kilobyte per second. And you can see that it's going up and if you live uh, in Singapore, you might be getting 100 meg, they talk about a gig. But most advanced countries are up at 100 meg these days. Sound reasonable? Australia's talking about a national broadband network that will give people 100 meg in about five years. The vertical axis is basically the ratio of the, the bit rate in the core of the network, the backbone, to the net access rate. And essentially the numbers, there's a ratio of about 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. It was 10 to the 4 for a while, then things sort of slowed down. So in other words, I think 10 to the 4 is the right number. In other words, if you're getting 100 megabits in the home, the bit rate in the core of the network is going to be 10 to the 4 times that. What is that number? And what's 10 to the 4 times 100 megabits? 1 terabit. So this number is sort of doesn't come out of nowhere. It's, it's been put up as a grand challenge for the communications research community um, for really for the next decade to create solutions for this terabit per second uh, process core network. Now the other example that it may be uh, even uh, easier to understand is in the context of these data centers because this is something that has only emerged in the last five years um, and you know Google have these massive data centers around the world where there's racks and racks of computers uh, terabytes of information, and this is the backbone of Google and all of the data that we access every day. Now the point is there's a huge amount of data transport in these uh, data centers. Uh, massive amounts of optical fiber. Um, now I, I find this, diagram, this picture hard to believe to be honest, but it actually gives you an example of sort of an optical fiber interconnect in a data center. That's all optical fiber. Huge amounts of fiber linking up different uh, computers thousands and thousands of servers and these data centers are consuming vast amounts of energy and in fact generating significant CO2 emission. Now these numbers are somewhat controversial 
Um, I base this on material that I found in the literature. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that it isn't accurate because there's a lot of controversy over the exact numbers here. Nobody's prepared to reveal, in fact, what they are. But without getting into the details of what percentage and what the data rate growth there is, the message is there's a lot of energy in these data centers. They're generating uh, CO2 emission. It's become a big deal. And it's in this context where we're starting to see the notion of terabit per second ethernet linking up over short distances these uh, enormous racks of um, computers using an optical uh, or a photonic link. Now, another a nice example that I've uh, taken from my colleague, the friend Shun Namiki in Japan. The Japanese always have a long-term perspective on energy and, the, and anything societal. And they've got a uh, consortium working towards this next generation internet. And they've realized that there is a crisis looming. And so this basically shows you, for the next uh, 40, 50 years, on the left-hand side, it shows you the annual energy consumption of IP routers, which is this red line. And the right-hand side is the uh, total internet traffic. You'll see that they're basically following each other. So as the capacity and the traffic increases, so does the energy consumption. Now this dash line here uh, is, is, is quite frightening because that's Japan's total electric, electricity generation in 2005. So what happens in 2020? So something's going to happen in the next 10 years. This is not going to happen, is it? They're not going to, there's no way they can allow the entire energy budget to, to be consumed by the internet. Now again, this is controversial. Do your own homework to check these facts, but this is based on work from the Japanese consortium. So either they need to build more nuclear reactors, or they need to come up with some radically new approaches to uh, routers and, and processing in these next generation communication systems. Um, now let me just, in the, in the next five minutes, talk through this recent result. So what we demonstrated here was a link between a source of a terabit per second and a receiver. This could have been simply across the room. It's a very short distance experiment. There's no need to go long distances because in the context of Ethernet, you're really only linking within a building. The challenge in doing this terabit per second is that the pulses are so short, they're already 350 femtoseconds in duration, that uh, simply creating these pulses in the first place, making sure these pulses are high quality, and then demultiplexing the pulses at the receiver is a very difficult proposition. And there are no electronic solutions available that allow you to uh, characterize these pulses. There's no RF spectrum analyzer that works with this bandwidth. Okay, so you need an all optical solution. So what we demonstrated in this zero result is using one of our photonic chips, we uh, placed it at the transmitter and we used it to do multi-impairment monitoring. I'll explain that. And at the receiver, we used the same chip to demultiplex this terabit per second signal down to a base rate. And we showed that this worked error-free. And so the point is that we're imagining one of these photonic chips in every node of this network uh, performing a number of basic functions, uh, as I mentioned, both monitoring at the transmitter here and demultiplexing. So these waveguides are compact, the gammas are enormous, they're dispersion engineered, so there's incredibly small amount of walk-off across the length scale of the device. And even though the insertion loss is large, it doesn't really matter in this context. Now the point is that um, these all-optical solutions can have enormous bandwidth. So the probably the fastest electronic solution available in the market, maybe it's 100 gigahertz. And it probably costs $100,000. But these all-optical solutions can have bandwidth of 2 or 3 terahertz. Okay? This is only limited, it's actually not even limited by the, the response time of the nonlinearity, it's actually limited by the small amount of dispersion on the length scale of the chip. But 2.8 terahertz is just mind-boggling in terms of information capacity. This is an order of magnitude faster than the fastest thing that most people have in their labs. So, in the... Am I telling what we've got? Five minutes? It's time now, but by all means... Why don't I just wrap this yeah. up and then we break? Yeah. So let me just talk through this concept, because this is key. Mark's going to talk about this later on. 
So let me just talk about our concept for an all-optical viral spectrum analyzer. What we need to do is measure the power spectrum of the temporal intensity of the source. Now, normally, most of your labs, and maybe even in your undergraduate labs, you use an RF spectrum analyzer. So you have a signal, you have a photo detector. This is a 4050 gigahertz detector, $10,000, and you have a $150,000 spectrum analyzer, an RF spectrum analyzer. The photo detector converts the signal intensity to an electronic signal, which is proportional to the intensity of the light, and this essentially performs a Fourier transform. We use this in a number of applications in telecommunications, in analog signals, and ultrafast laser science. So if you don't really understand the power spectrum, let me tr try and illustrate this concept this way. Imagine that I've got a, a pulse, and I'm going to send this pulse through a, a 100 meters of optical fiber, and the pulse is going to disperse. And here I've got my optical spectrum analyzer, which is a grating-based device that just scatters the different frequencies and it has a detector. Okay, that's an optical spectrum analyzer. And here's my RO spectrum analyzer. Pulse propagating through a dispersive medium will distort in time, but the optical spectrum doesn't change, does it? But the RF spectrum does, or the power spectrum does change, because the power spectrum is associated with the envelope of the intensity. So the point is the power spectrum tells us things that we don't see in the optical spectrum. It reveals aspects of the waveform that we won't see in the optical spectrum. And in fact, it's more powerful than that. It will tell us specifically what's happening to the um, waveform. So the concept that we uh, reported last year, uh, a photonic chip based RF spectrum analyzer with terahertz bandwidth, is very simple in fact. We take a signal and we co-propagate that signal through a chip with a CW probe. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Okay, so the signal is that this is what we want to characterize. And there's no power spectrum analyzer. This is simply an OSA. Okay, simple OSA. So this is the signal that we want to characterize. This is the CW probe. The cross phase modulation now modulates the phase of that CW probe via cross phase modulation. The intensity fluctuations of the signal are mapped onto the phase of the probe. And the probe is now broadened and acquires this additional structure. Well, it turns out in about two lines of algebra, you can convince yourself that, in fact, the optical spectrum here is identical to the power spectrum. In other words, you've replaced this high-speed photo detector with this nonlinear response, this instantaneous nonlinear response, and you replaced the RO spectrum analyzer with an optical spectrum analyzer. So how does this work? And I'll read out up it in five minutes. So what we've do done here is we've integrated this chip with this CW laser into the transmitter. And what we're doing is we're creating this terabit per second signal by multiplexing these low bit rate signals up. The problem is it's very difficult to do, very hard to get it right. And, but we can here now measure, the, this is the power spectrum we measure. Notice the horizontal scale. Okay, five terahertz. Imagine in your lab an electronic RF spectrum analyzer that goes out to five terahertz, unheard of. So this is what we measure. And we look at that power spectrum, and remember we're trying to create a 1.28 terabit per second signal. We look at that, we go, mm, not very good, is it? Because I can clearly see a 640 gigahertz clock tone there. So that tells me something's going wrong. Maybe the multiplex is not working and I've got a signal that looks like this. Okay? So that 640 gigahertz tone is associated with some other uh, variation, some, uh, something went wrong. So I tweak up my multiplexer. And I go, oh, okay, whoa. I got rid of that 640 gigahertz tone, but now I've got some other structure here. What's going on here? Well, a little bit of back of the envelope says, well, that's probably dispersion. Maybe I haven't matched the dispersion perfectly here. A meter of fiber is enough to disperse this, this short pulse. So I sweeten that up and, well, this is as good as we got, probably not perfect, but at least here we see this very strong tone at 1.28 terahertz. We see no, nothing really, remember this is 20 dB above anything else. We see some structure here, but it's probably 15 dB down. At this point, we're confident that we now have a very strong 
pretty clean 1.28 terabit per second signal. So we can inject that into our link and we can propagate that to the other side. But now we need to demultiplex. So this is the last part of the story that we'll break. We now need to demultiplex. So we've got this 1.28 terabit per second signal. Pulses are 300 femtoseconds. And what I want to do is extract pulses out of that train. And uh, the way I'm going to do that is to use optical time division multiplexing where I'm going to extract every 128th pulse and then do the electronics on that low bit rate signal. And I need to do that 128 times. Here I've only done it once, but I can generalize this principle. And I'm going to rely on four-way mixing. So I've got my signal and I've got a pump pulse. This is, we call this a clock. This will be at, say, 10 gigahertz. And the principle is four-way mixing. So here's my signal. When my pump pulse overlaps with a time slot, and there's a one here, and there's a pump here, it mixes and creates an idler at another frequency, and I get a, a, I get a one, and I can do bit error rate on that, and I can electronically detect that. But I've got nothing there, nothing there, nothing there, and then a one here, then nothing there, nothing there, nothing here, and a zero there. And so I can use that to build up my um, low bit rate signal. And so the spectrum is quite remarkable. So this is now the, 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 the frequency spread here. So this is the 1.28 terabit per second signal. Okay, it almost covers the entire C-band. This is really something you don't see very often. It's one data channel that spans across almost the entire C-band. 1.28 terabits per second of, of, of capacity. This is the clock, 10 gigahertz. And this is the idler that we demultiplex. Now it looks very low, that's because the duty cycle is 128 times lower. But if you account for that, you actually get quite a strong idler and the four-way mixing conversion efficiency is about 60%. Now, I don't want to go into any more detail than that and I'll stop here, but the punchline of this result is that it worked error-free with very small system penalty. And so we were able to do bit error rate on that uh, 10 gigabit per second um, tributary without any errors. And that highlights that this is a pure nonlinearity. There are no free carriers. That it's working as an instantaneous switch. And that, that really establishes quite convincingly that uh, the, the, the proposition of doing 1.28 terabit per second Ethernet uh, in the future. So I think I'll end there, a bit late, and um, take a break. All right, so are there any questions for Ben now?